a man drags himself to the hospital, checking in for extreme vomiting and stomach pains. His condition quickly worsened, and he insisted he had been poisoned. Determined to seek justice, he pieced together the events that led to his sudden illness. He'd had a lunch meeting with a friend the day he fell sick, and then went to discuss a business venture with an old colleague from his home country. As he lay on what he knew was his deathbed, he recounted several hours of incredibly detailed witness testimony, vital puzzle pieces which enabled investigators to solve his inevitable murder. A case that involved three men, a business meeting, and a poisoned teacup. <laughs>
it was clear that he would be suppressed by any means necessary. He was then charged with stealing ammunition and explosives and faced eight years in prison. Alexander knew he had no future in Russia now that he was a target. With Berezovsky's help, he and his family ran away to England where they applied for asylum. Berezovsky had recently fled to London and hired Alexander as part of his personal security team. Now that he was not under constant threat, Alexander was able to voice his beliefs publicly and report on what he had seen during his employment with the Russian government. He became an author and investigative journalist, focusing on exposing the hidden crimes of the FSB and Russian corruption. He called Russia corrupt and said the government, crime, and intelligence industries were one and the same. He also became a consultant for MI6, the British spy agency, an informant for Spain on the Russian criminal network there. Years after Alexander moved to London, Andre Legovoy, an old colleague, contacted him. Andre had been a member of Berezovsky's security team in Russia at the same time as Alexander, and he got back in touch with Alexander to discuss a business opportunity. The two men decided to work together and advise Western companies to invest in Russia. Just a few weeks after Anna's passing and Alexander's public accusations, Andre traveled to London for a business meeting with Alexander. He brought another man, Dmitry Kovtin, with him. According to the staff at the hotel they stayed in, the two men looked like stereotypes of Eastern European gangsters with loud, ill-fitting suits, bright shirts and ties, and clunky jewelry. The three men met in a boardroom at Irinus, an intelligence firm in London, and were hosted by Tim Riley, the head of the firm. This was the first time Alexander had met Dmitri, who introduced himself as Andre's business partner, but he felt an instinctive dislike for him. They discussed the weather, then Andre joked about how it would be appropriate for them to have some tea, since they were in England and the British were known for their love of tea. Tim made tea for his guests, and the meeting was underway. Later that day, after the meeting had finished, Alexander felt unwell and had to throw up, but recovered quickly. The two Russians flew back to Moscow, but Andre came back to London only a week later, this time alone. He met with Alexander in the Palm Court Bar at an upscale hotel. The two drank tea and discussed their business idea further. The following week, Andre and Dmitri were back in London yet again. This time, they were accompanied by Andre's wife and kids, and another friend. The group was on a trip to watch a football match, CSKA Moscow playing Arsenal in a Champions League. But while they were in town, wanted to meet up with Alexander again. Alexander already had plans for the day and was meeting an Italian associate for lunch. He got a call from Andre around noon, asking him to meet later that day. Alexander agreed, and Andre told him to come to the Millennium, an expensive hotel in London. As Alexander ate lunch with his friend, Andre constantly called him, impatient, urging him to hurry up as they would have to leave for the football match soon. Alexander got to the Millennium at 4 p.m., and Andre approached, inviting him to come sit at the bar. Andre had already been ordering drinks for himself, but he knew that Alexander didn't drink alcohol. He was also living very modestly at the time, and wasn't planning to order and pay for anything expensive at this luxury hotel. So when the bartender asked Alexander if he would like anything, he said no. Andre then offered Alexander some tea from a pot that was on the table, and asked the waiter for a clean mug. There wasn't much tea left, maybe a half cup, and it was already cold. Alexander took a few polite gulps, but didn't finish it. The two were then joined by Dmitri, the three men had a meeting the next day with a private security firm who was interested in investigating in Russia. Their discussion at the Millennium Hotel Bar lasted only 20 minutes before they went their separate ways. As he was leaving, Alexander had the strangest feeling that he was in danger, and the two men he had met were not his friends. That evening, Alexander became violently sick and had to be hospitalized. Doctors didn't know what to do. His mixture of symptoms, including bone marrow failure and gut damage, perplexed medical staff, who suspected a form of poisoning but could not pin down a specific diagnosis. His condition worsened over the next few weeks, and after 17 days of illness, Scotland Yard was alerted to the fact that a man was in the hospital sick from suspected poisoning that could have been a murder attempt. Officers came to visit Alexander, 
and investigate the cause of his sudden sickness. As the officers questioned Alexander, they discovered that he was not only an excellent witness, but an investigator himself. As he lay bedridden, he was trying to solve his own attempted assassination. Alexander had a lot of detective experience and strong observational skills from his time in the FSB. He described in detail the appearance, height, clothing, and mannerisms of the people he had come into contact with, where and when he met them, and his interactions, recounting conversations from start to finish. Combing through the events leading up to his illness, Alexander plainly stated that only three people could have possibly poisoned him. He highlighted his Italian associate, but didn't really suspect him, as well as Andre and his business partner whose name Alexander guessed at, but couldn't quite remember. This was Dimitri. In total, Alexander provided an incredible nine hours of witness testimony that would be vital to solving the case. He even called his wife and asked her to search their home for an old photo of Andre. Alexander was firm in his belief that the Secret Services was behind the poisoning, and convinced that the serious action of exterminating a citizen of another country had to have been approved by Putin himself. As Alexander recorded his interviews, he grew sicker and sicker, and his lawyer started to draft a statement for him. It spoke about Alexander's love for his wife, how proud he was to be British, and that he blamed the Russian government and president for his poisoning. His statement said, You may succeed in silencing one man, but the howl of protest from around the world will reverberate, Mr. Putin, in your ears for the rest of your life. Just days later, Alexander went into cardiac arrest. He was resuscitated and put on a life support machine in an induced coma. During this period, Scotland Yard received a call from a lab that had analyzed Alexander's urine. They confirmed that he had been poisoned by radioactive polonium-210, which had never been known to enter England before. Alexander passed away six hours later on November 23, 2006, as the first known victim in the world of polonium-210 poison. Alexander was gone and investigators had to rely on his deathbed testimony to point them in the right direction for evidence. Polonium is an extremely radioactive substance, and when ingested or inhaled, one of the most toxic poisons in the world. It can't pass through physical barriers, such as human skin, so as long as it doesn't enter the body, it's safe to handle. But if even the smallest amount is ingested, it does terrible harm to the victim's organs and can take their life. A tiny speck of the substance the size of a pinhead is 3,000 times the lethal dose for humans. It is difficult to identify polonium poisoning unless you are looking for it, since the symptoms can look like poisoning from more common substances. It also did not trigger common radiation detectors of the time because it only gives off alpha particles, which can't even pass through a piece of paper. This particular polonium sample had come from a nuclear reactor in the Ural Mountains, then processed in a secret FSB lab in Sarov, Russia. Now that the investigators knew what to look for and who to investigate, they began testing the locations where Alexander had been for Polonium and gained access to CCTV footage at the Millennium while gathering information on the activities of Andre and Dimitri leading up to the meeting. The entire story was painstakingly pieced together. Dimitri later stated that he arrived at the hotel at 4 p.m., around the same time that Alexander did. CCTV footage showed that he actually showed up in the lobby half an hour earlier. The pair had entered the men's washrooms at the Millennium Hotel, and investigators found an alarming amount of radiation contamination in one of the cubicles. The footage also proved that Alexander never entered the washroom, so Andre and Dimitri had to be the ones who brought in the substance. Forensics found the teapot they must have used, because it gave off extremely high readings of polonium confirming Alexander's theory of having ingested it through the tea he drank. Using the readings, experts located the chairs and the table the men met at, with the highest levels on Dimitri's chair. Traces of polonium were found on the dishwasher, the floor, the till, a coffee strainer, an ice cream scooper, a chopping board, and bottles of alcohol behind the bar. The assassins evidently did not care about potential contamination and risks to other people at the hotel. When forensics tested the hotel rooms of the two men, the polonium levels in Dimitri's bathroom sink were so high that the only conclusion possible was that the remaining amount had been poured down the sink to dispose of it. 
They also traced the substance all the way back to other locations the assassins had been at, including on the planes they had taken to London. All the clues painted a clear story. The men had been sent from Moscow to assassinate Alexander, setting up false meetings with the intention of getting him to drink poison tea. And this was not the only attempt. The location of their first meeting, the boardroom at the intelligence firm, was teeming with radiation. Dimitri and Andre must have poured the polonium into his cup of tea, but Alexander did not drink anything at that first meeting. He narrowly escaped death, but had thrown up once later that day, probably from exposure and breathing near the poison tea. Still, he survived without even knowing about the attempt, and the assassins would have to try again. Again, high levels of radiation were found in Andre's bathroom sink where he had stayed indicating that he poured it down to get rid of it. The unsuccessful assassins then flew back to Moscow, with Andre coming back to London only a week later, this time alone, but with another container of polonium. Alexander had drank tea that time, but it appears that Andre never used the poison. He may have spotted the cameras around the room, or was worried he was being watched. Whatever the reason, he did not use the polonium and again poured the substance down his bathroom sink. The entire washroom and hotel room were highly contaminated, and scientists testing the location asked to be excused from the room for safety reasons. Polonium was very expensive, and having to travel back to London with yet another batch would have been inconvenient. Andre and Dimitri would have been desperate to get it right the third time, and resentful from their previous failures, which may be why Alexander picked up on negative feelings coming from the two men instead of excitement about the potential of their business venture. Andre or Dimitri were so reckless with their handling of the poison that it seems like they were unaware of how traceable and dangerous the poison was. Maybe because they knew it was difficult to detect inside the human body, and traditional instruments detecting poison didn't pick up on polonium. But if you are looking specifically for polonium, the trail it leaves is long-lasting and obvious. And after that third meeting at the hotel, everything Alexander touched gave positive radioactive readings. Despite all the evidence, the judicial process took years and had many delays. Dimitri and Andre both denied involvement in Alexander's poisoning and actually accused Alexander of trying to poison them with polonium. The two Russians would claim that it was Alexander who first tried to poison them at that initial meeting at Arenas, and so he was the cause of the radiation trail that followed them afterwards, but this was simple to disprove. Alexander's previous locations and possessions had not been contaminated until he met the assassins. Whereas investigators could determine every single place the Russians had been by tracing the radioactive trail, Dmitri was actually hospitalized for radiation poisoning a month after he traveled to London, from being constantly exposed. Russia had also denied a request from the UK to extradite Andre to face criminal charges. Marina, Alexander's wife, continued to put pressure on officials to investigate and charge the people responsible. Ten years after Alexander passed away, a UK public inquiry found Andre and Dimitri responsible for poisoning him, suggested that it was very likely they had acted under orders from their government, and accused Russia of failing to properly investigate the assassination. In 2021, 15 years after the incident, the European Court of Human Rights found Russia responsible for the crime and ordered the state to pay Alexander's wife over 100,000 euros in damages. A Russian spokesperson dismissed the ruling and said Moscow would not pay the penalty. Dmitry passed away in 2021, and as of 2023, Andre is still an MP in Russia's parliament. Neither man ever faced court or imprisonment for the assassination. Alexander was the first confirmed victim of polonium-210 radiation poisoning. Fifteen years before officials determined the ruling, Alexander himself, while on his deathbed, was able to deduce the series of events and gave a public statement that pointed the finger at the Russian government. His accusations received worldwide media coverage, and the following investigation led to political issues between the UK and Russia. While it's unfortunate that the process took so long, Alexander's family, friends, and supporters finally had some closure, and an official ruling that proves the statements he was so determined to say on his deathbed.
based on our recent video about a man trapped at the bottom of the sea whose life was saved by a mattress and a bottle of coke, we put a poll on Twitter asking, if you only had one bottle of liquid to last you three days, what drink would it be? And it looks like water was the winner, which might seem like the responsible choice, but Gatorade might actually be better with the sugar and electrolytes to help keep you going. But I'm still choosing coffee.